Hi, I've made this video primarily to update e-scooter enthusiasts across Australia and particularly my state of New South Wales on progress towards legalisation. And full disclosure, as a human being, a parent and a grandparent, I consider myself to be a stakeholder in the future of our planet. And so I make no apology for my bias towards green technologies. Technologies that can greatly improve the long-term health of the biosphere upon which all life depends. If you have taken even a fleeting glimpse at the science, you'll know that we face an existential threat in the form of climate change. The problem is a wicked one to be sure, but our greatest failure so far has been to not take it seriously. You don't need to look too far to see what happens when wicked problems are not taken seriously. The failure of global leaders to take decisive and pragmatic action when confronted by a novel virus has resulted in a global pandemic, the likes of which the world hasn't seen in a hundred years. Where climate change is concerned, there is no shortage of solutions, just a lack of political will to support them. Micromobility is perhaps the quintessential example of this. In e-scooters, we have a technology that can greatly reduce carbon emissions and at the same time improve public health by taking thousands of cars off the road every peak hour. If you want to know just how much of a difference e-scooters can make at just a 5% uptake, please look at my other video here. And so, I hear you ask, why is there not widespread adoption of this miracle technology? Well, our politicians want to engage in endless taxpayer-funded reports and inquiries, run trials, gather data, and then, like the New South Wales Minister for Transport, declare, oh, you know what, I'm just not in the mood to do anything about this right now. Now, I don't know about you, but all of this frustrates the crap out of me. It makes me want to slap them across the face with a wet fish and shout, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Look, if we're lucky, we may have 10 years left to kick our addiction to fossil fuels. We simply can't afford to spend the next nine of them sitting on obvious solutions like personal electric vehicles. Oh, and if I hear one more politician say, oh, why don't you just ride a bike? I'm going to get the wet fish again. The climate in Australia is simply too hot and too humid to ride a bicycle to work. Who wants to arrive wetter than said fish? And besides, I don't see too many politicians offering to give up their air-conditioned com car to take a quick sprint on the Melbourne Star, do you? <laughs> anyway, that's the end of my rant for today. It's time to get to the topic at hand, which is legalisation of scooters in Australia. It's quite a lengthy topic, so I've split it up into sections, and these are time-stamped in the description section. So please, sit back, relax, get yourself something to drink, and enjoy the ride. Okay, now before we start, I needed to have some basis for comparing all of the states in terms of their friendliness towards e-scooters. And so I've developed this thing that I call the e-scooter friendliness scorecard. It's just a spreadsheet and we've got across the top here uh, all of the states. The first column there is uh, the Australian road rules. So I treat that as a jurisdiction in its own right and I'll be giving that a score as well. And then down here we've got the point scoring system. So we've got a 1 to 10 score system. Um, and you'll note that some of them have more points than others. So you get one point for recognising e-scooters in the road rules. If you look at the second row though, it's a bit more differentiated than that. You get uh, or a further one point if they're recognised only as motorised scooters with a capacity of less than 200 watts. However, if you recognise them at a capacity greater than 200 watts, um, then you get to, you score two points. So we'll go down through these uh, rows and uh, tally them all up, and each uh, jurisdiction will get a score, and at the end of it, then we'll be able to see who the winner is, and also, of course, who the loser is. But wow. Uh, down the bottom here, this is more just qualitative information. It's not given a score, but it just gives you some idea of the sorts of uh, things like speed limits that apply and penalties that may apply if you breach and also if there's a minimum age specified for being allowed to ride a scooter. So we'll see more of this as we go through and uh, hopefully it'll make sense. 
Now, one other thing, there's a term that pops up quite regularly when you look through all the state legislation, and the term is road-related area. So this is often paired with any legislation related to road rules. So the legislation might say you cannot ride a electric scooter on a road or road-related area. So just to be clear on a road, what a road-related area is, I've just pulled this off the New South Wales website, but it's the same from state to state pretty much. So they define it as an area that divides a road, a footpath or nature strip adjacent to a road, an area that is not a road and that is open to the public and designated for use by cyclists or animals. And lastly, an area that is not a road and that is open to or used by the public for driving, riding or parking vehicles. It goes on below that in section two to talk about a shoulder of a road and a footpath or nature strip as defined in the dictionary. So you can pretty much say that road related areas are are all the areas that are adjacent to roads like the nature strips, the footpaths, the parking areas, those sorts of things, and they are covered under this law. So if the law prohibits you from riding on a road it and it states that it includes a road-related area, then it means that you can't ride it on the footpath or the nature strip or any such area. So I just wanted to put clarify that one for you because it does pop up from time to time. If you are still with me, then I assume you probably live in Australia and you will already know that our transport law is a patchwork of state-based legislation. That said, at a national level, there are three relevant instruments we could take a look at. The first is the Motor Vehicle Standards Act 1989. This governs the import and supply of road vehicles. Its overseers, the Department of Infrastructure, have deemed motorised scooters to be a non-road vehicle under the Act meaning they are not permitted for use on public roads. As such, they cannot be registered for road use. To assist with identification, the department provide this drawing of a typical motorised scooter. They also refer to personal mobility devices being another form of non-road vehicle that looks like this. Some key features described on the website are as follows. A personal mobility device is not more than 1250 millimetres in length, weighs 60 kilograms or less when the vehicle is not carrying a person or other load, is propelled by an electric motor, and when propelled only by the motor, cannot reach a speed of more than 25 kilometers an hour on level ground. Motorized scooters share similar characteristics to PMDs. However, they are limited by motor power rather than maximum speed. The website says, to be assessed as a non-road vehicle, a motorized scooter must have a maximum power output of 200 watts or less and where a motorized scooter exceeds 200 watts and does not meet the definition of a personal mobility device it may be considered an LA slash LB moped. Okay so my electric scooter is not covered by the rules pertaining to road vehicles but what rules do apply? Well my dear confused scooter owner you won't find the answer here at infrastructure and transport but what we can tell you is this Individual states and territories may have specific rules and requirements regarding the use of non-road vehicles. And now you're probably thinking, that's about as satisfying as a celery smoothie. The second piece of national legislation is the Australian Design Rules, or ADR. These are national standards for vehicle safety, anti-theft and emissions. Generally, any motor vehicle that is intended for registration and use on public roads must comply with these standards. Recall the Motor Vehicle Standards Act 1989 has deemed motorised scooters and PMDs to be non-road vehicles and therefore they are not covered by the ADR. You will see how this plays out when we look at the rules state by state. Many of the state and territory governments have chosen to use this as a reason for not approving the use of e-scooters on public roads. The final piece of national regulation is the Australian Road Rules or ARR. These are not legislation, but rather a set of model road rules maintained by the National Transport Commission, or NTC. The rules are a template only. The actual laws are those legislated in each state and territory. However, most states and territories have adopted the rules as legislation with minor variations. In its current form, the ARR doesn't recognise personal mobility devices or electric scooters. However, that is about to change. I will talk about this a bit more in the latest news section at the end of this presentation. 
Okay, so returning to our friendliness scorecard, we can complete the first column, which is the Australian Road Rules column. And I'm going to give the uh, first uh, e-scooters recognised road rules one point. I'm going to award them half a point for that because they don't currently recognise the, the e-scooters, but they are about to. It's uh, in the final draft and should be released in March 2021. Uh, sorry, May 2021. So that should only be about a month away from where we are now. So I'll give them half a point for that at this stage. And um, that's about all I can give them right now. But uh, there is some other information that's relevant in there. Obviously, they have a speed limit on footpaths of 10 kilometers an hour. And um, they have a speed limit specified on roads of 25 kilometers an hour. So we can put that in there. Uh, and there's no penalties. Uh, as I said, it's not uh, legislation, it's only model rules, so therefore there are no penalties. So that's about as much as we can do for the Australian road rules at this stage, but uh, it looks promising in that they're changing towards more acceptance of micro-mobility. So let us now go and take a look at the rules that apply in each state and territory. The words progressive and Queensland don't usually go together. However, where e-scooters are concerned, our banana bending friends are leading the charge. Brisbane was in fact the first Australian city to trial electric scooters when they licensed Lime to do so in 2018. Looking at the Queensland Transport website, we see there is a description of a personal mobility device that matches the one in the national standard. However, the drawing provided is very different. It depicts a typical electric scooter. So it seems like the government have sensibly recognised the obvious. Most electric scooters have motors with output greater than 200 watts. They have also adopted the more generic term of rideables to refer to the vast array of devices available to hire or buy. On a different page with the heading Wheeled Recreational Devices, references made to a foot scooter with a small electric motor 200 watts or under. Thus, the Queensland lawmakers seem to be grouping low-powered e-scooters with non-powered wheeled toys, like push scooters and skateboards. This would seem a reasonable approach. Okay, so here we are at the Queensland Transport website, and this is the page that tells you about the rules around personal mobility devices, or as they also call them, rideables in Queensland. And if you look at this top section here that talks about the definition of a rideable, all of those descriptors are all the same as what we saw previously in the national legislation. So they have exactly copied uh, the descriptions of a personal mobility device under the Import Act, and they've transposed that into their own uh, road rules for rideables. So that's the description. And then under that you have the rules for rideables and this is all common sense stuff really about safety and wearing a helmet. Uh, it has an age restriction and uh, tells you how to uh, have regard for pedestrians. So that's all pretty straightforward. And then we get to the specifics about using a rideable. And this is quite interesting here. So it says that rideables should be used on paths wherever possible. However, it says that some limited access to roads is permitted only in specific circumstances, which are detailed below. For example, you can use your rideable to cross a road or avoid an obstruction on a path up to 50 metres. Um, so when you go down a bit further, it says here that you can ride on local streets where it is safe to do so. A local street is defined as a road with a speed limit of 50 kilometers or less. It must have no dividing line or median strip. And if it is, in a one, if it is a one-way road, it can't have more than one lane. So that's good that they've clearly defined what they mean by a local street. And so that gives you quite a wide degree of latitude on where you can ride in in the suburbs, I would suggest, because uh, most you know quiet suburban streets are going to be a 50 kilometer limit these days. You must not ride on main roads or streets in the Brisbane CBD. So in Brisbane CBD, you're pretty much confined to designated areas and paths and cycleways. 
When permitted to ride on a street, you must keep as far to the left of the road as practicable. That's understandable. And as with bicycles, you can ride two abreast. However, you must not cause a traffic hazard. It draws your attention to the fact that there are restricted areas where e-scooters cannot be ridden and it shows you a diagram of a typical sign that you might see that um, informs you you can't ride in this area. And of course there's a penalty. There's always a penalty for non-compliance, in this case $133. And the last bit just uh, singles out special conditions that may apply for hire companies. Now, the other int interesting thing about this is that at the bottom here it says that it was last updated on the 1st of July 2019. So this is getting quite old. It's already 18 months old and it appears it hasn't been changed in the, that time, which is kind of interesting because a lot's been going on with regards to micro mobility and e-scooters. And I would have expected there would have been some refining of some of these rules, but it Seems like, as far as the government's concerned, they got it right the first time, so that's pretty good. Okay, so it's back to our scorecard, and we can now put in the scores for Queensland. And they recognise scooters in their road rules, so they get one point for that. They also recognise them as personal mobility devices, or as they prefer to call them, rideables. And they have no power limit, so they get three points for that. Trials have been planned and indeed trials are underway, although the trials haven't completed as yet, so they don't get the point there. The trials have been extended, as I understand, until the end of 2021. Electric scooters are legal on private property. They're also legal on footpaths and shared paths. However, they're not legal on bike lanes. They are legalised for use on public roads where they have a speed limit of less than uh, 50 kilometres an hour, so suburban roads. Speed limit on footpaths is 25 kilometres an hour, which is uh, fairly fast, uh, faster than any other state, and you could argue that's probably a bit too fast for footpath riding. However, that's what it is, and it's also the same limit on roads so 25 kilometres an hour. Penalty for non-compliance is $133 at this stage. And you need to be 16 years old or older to ride a scooter. So that's the Queensland score done. Nine out of a possible 12 points, not bad. I want to deal with all the scooter-friendly states first, so we'll skip over New South Wales and head to the ACT. Like Queensland, the ACT can also be called scooter-friendly. The ACT government has taken the sensible approach of classifying all electric scooters as personal mobility devices. Their definition of a PMD is pretty much the same as the national one. You are free to purchase or ride your own scooter or avail either of the two ride-sharing companies that were selected for the urban trial, Neuron and Beam. The Transport ACT website, FAQs, advises that e-scooters are permitted on footpaths, shared paths, the bicycle side of separated paths and bicycle paths. The ACT policing website advises that they are generally not permitted on roads, however they can be ridden on suburban streets where there is no accessible footpath. I think this government video explains the rules better than I could. E-scooters, e-skateboards and other similar devices can now be used in the ACT. The golden rule is, sharing the road is everyone's responsibility. The speed limit is 15 kilometres per hour when travelling on a footpath and 25 when on a shared path or other permitted locations. Slow down to 10 k's when riding across a pedestrian crossing. And you can't use your mobile phone or be under the influence while riding. Wear a helmet, use a warning bell and always give way to other pedestrians. To find out more, go to act.gov.au forward slash e-scooters. There now. Wasn't that encouraging? Makes this tired old New South Welshman yearn for progressive government. So I think it's time to score the ACT, don't you? In terms of uh, recognition in the rules, yes, they are recognised in the rules. They're recognised with no power limit as a personal mobility device, so they score a three for that. Trials are planned. 
and in fact trials are underway but not completed yet. They are legal on private property and they're legal on footpaths and shared paths and they are legal on 50 kilometre roads the stipulation being that only they can only be ridden on those roads where there's an obstruction that prevents you from riding on the footpath so um, that one probably needs a qualification on it um, and in terms of speed limits uh, their speed limit is, their general speed limit is 15 kilometers an hour on footpaths and on roads it goes up to 25 um, the p penalty for non-compliance within the ACT is uh, $153. And the minimum age there is interesting. You only need to be 12 years old. So well done ACT. Uh, equal best score at the moment with Queensland on nine points. OK, now let's take a short scoot down to Victoria. There has been much talk of scooter trials happening in Melbourne, however these seem to have stalled since COVID-19 arrived. On the Vic Roads website, under the heading Scooters and Wheeled Recreational Devices, there is reference to a motorised scooter being a foot scooter propelled by an electric motor with output less than 200 watts and top speed of 10 kilometres an hour. So this description adds a speed limit to the description of motorised scooters found on the Department of Infrastructure website. Motorised scooters have the same rules as wheeled recreational devices, plus the rider must wear a helmet and the scooter must have a brake and bell. Any powered scooter that is faster or more powerful than the aforementioned motorised scooter is deemed non-compliant. Use of a non-compliant scooter on roads or road-related areas attracts a fine of $826. Hmm, that sounds mighty unfriendly to me. In the section Hoverboards, Segways and other motorised personal mobility devices, motorised scooters are specifically excluded from this family. This may be a good thing, as all devices in the family are banned except on private property. Apparently, this is because the government has chosen to classify them as motor vehicles under the Road Safety Act 1986, and since they cannot carry a licence plate, they cannot be registered, and therefore they cannot be used on public roads. Interesting application of a 20th century law to a 21st century transportation device, don't you think? I wonder how the Jetsons would get on down at the motor registry. OK, so time to score Victoria. And they get uh, one point for the uh, fact that they recognise scooters in the road rules. Um, they only recognise them as motorised scooters with a maximum power of 200 watts, so they only get one point in that category. Trials are planned, however they haven't commenced, so they only get the one point for having planned trials. Let's hope someday soon they'll actually get underway. Um, electric scooters are legal in Victoria only on private property. So they get a point for that and that's pretty much all they get. So a total of four points out of a possible 12 for Victoria. And their speed limit uh, on footpaths is the same as their speed limit on roads which is 10 kilometres an hour. And if you get caught down there riding a scooter that's prohibited in a place where you shouldn't be riding it, i.e. not on public property, then you'll be facing a fine of $826. Oops, forgot the dollar sign. $826. So a fair whack. And that's Victoria. So, next stop, Tassie. And make sure you've taken that Dramamine, because... Fangs can get a bit gnarly out there on Bass Street. The Apple Isle is a bit of a laggard when it comes to e-scooter laws, with the last revision being made way back in 2009. Ah, what were you doing back in the noughties? <laughs> Ah, 
Well, back then, the Tasmanian government recognised motorised scooters in the family of wheeled recreational devices. Their definition states that a motorised scooter must have an electric motor not exceeding 200 watts capacity and a top speed of 10 kilometres an hour. Geez, I hope they were handing out their G-suits. Since the 30th of November 2009, their use has been permitted on paths and roads where the speed limit is 50 kilometres or less, but not on roads with a dividing line or median strip. Any scooter that has a higher specification is deemed to be a motor vehicle. Unfortunately, it can't be registered for road use as it doesn't meet the minimum safety requirements set out in the Australian Design Rules, ADR. Such devices can be legally owned but only ridden on private property. There are currently no e-scooter trials planned in Tasmania. Okay, so now we can come back and score Tasmania and they get uh, the first point for recognising e-scooters in their road rules. Unfortunately, they only recognise them as motorised scooters with a limit of 200 watts power, so they only get a further one point for that. They haven't had, they have no trials planned or underway at the moment, so no points there, but they do get a point for allowing them on private property. Mind you, it's hard to imagine how you could disallow anything on somebody doing it on their own property, but anyway, there you go. Point for that. Easiest point you'll get. They have a 10 kilometer an hour speed limit on footpaths and a 10 kilometer hour per hour speed limit on roads. And I was unable to find any reference to fines or penalties. However, I expect that if they caught you doing the wrong thing, they would certainly come up with one. If anyone knows what it is, please let me know in the comment section. And that's Tasmania. Well, what about South Australia? They're pretty progressive, aren't they? What are their e-scooter rules like? Well, the South Australian government have taken the approach of calling all forms of micro-mobility motorised wheeled recreational devices. The My Licence website states that These devices cannot be used on roads or road-related areas such as footpaths, bike pedestrian tracks or vehicle parking areas. As these devices do not meet the safety standards under the Australian design rules, they are not eligible for registration. <laughs> So yet again, we face the ADR objection. If the story ended there, then electric scooters could only be used on private property in South Australia, regardless of their power or maximum speed. However, the South Australian government have agreed to conduct trials of higher scooters within designated geofenced areas of the CBD. These commenced in 2020, but were suspended due to the COVID pandemic. They have now recommenced. At this stage, privately owned scooters are still not allowed in public areas. However, they can be ridden on private property. Okay, so time to score uh, South Australia and they get the first point for recognising scooters in the road rules. Um, they don't recognise them at any specific power. Um, so I can't really give them the second point. Uh, as yet they're only under trial and they haven't specified a maximum power for electric scooters outside of the trial so it's a bit hard to award that point. Trials are planned of course and underway in Adelaide and then we come down to legalised on private property they get the point for that and they're legal on footpaths and shared paths under the trial so that gives South Australia a score of five points. So middle of the road. And they get uh, 15, uh, their limit is 15 kilometres an hour on roads and 15 kilometres an hour on uh, footpaths. And they have a range of penalties. Actually, they've got 11, would you believe it, 11 different penalties, fines that can be applied for misbehaving on a scooter, which is more than any other state. So they... Uh, Certainly got ahead of the game on that. The maximum penalty appears to be $398 and the penalty for speeding is $183. You need to be 18 years old to ride a scooter under the trial but you don't need to hold a licence. 
OK, time to head over to Western Australia, land of iron ore, cute marsupials and place names ending with up. The West Australian government has taken the conservative approach of only permitting scooters with maximum power of 200 watts and maximum speed of 10 kilometres per hour to be ridden in public areas. In other words, motorised scooters as defined by the national regulations. They are permitted on pathways and shared pathways in suburban roads with less than 50 km an hour speed limits. A trial with beam hire scooters was commenced in Bunbury, 160 km south of Perth in early 2020 but was suspended just one month later due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's expected to resume at a future time. Okie dokes, so we can score WA now and uh, they do get the first point for um, recognising scooters in the rules. Um, They only recognise them at less than 200 watts, so they get a further single point for that. Um, They have uh, trials planned. I can't really give them the point for having them underway because they were quickly suspended a month after they started, so at this stage... We're waiting for them to restart, so that's all I can give them for for that. Uh, and at this stage, therefore, they're only allowed uh, to be used on private property. So that gives them a total of four points. And in terms of speed limits, their speed limit on paths and on roads is 10 kilometres an hour. I haven't been able to find what the penalties are in WA for illegal use of scooters, but if anyone can tell me that, please let me know. And I couldn't find an age limit either for use under the trial. So uh, likewise, if you know what that is, let me know. And if you live in Bunbury and you rode a scooter for a short time, let me know how much fun it was. OK, let's scoot up to the Northern Territory and don't feed the crocs. The Department of Transport website says that motorised scooters over 200 watts are classified as motor vehicles. They are prohibited in all public places due to the fact that they are not registrable, as they do not meet the ADR standards. Hmm, there's an echo in here. In January 2020, the City of Darwin commenced a 12-month trial with Neuron as the chosen share hire operator. This was extended for another 12 months in October 2020. The rules of the trial are as follows. Firstly, you must be over 18, but no license is required. You must wear a helmet, and the usual rules around sticking to footpaths unless it is not practical to do so apply. Uh, There is a 15 km an hour speed limit for the trial in all areas. Interestingly, the rules permit scooters to ride in bicycle lanes on public roads. This is not allowed in most other states. Okay, so now we can test, uh, uh, sorry, we can score Northern Territory, and they get one point for having the scooters recognised in their road rules. They're only recognised at uh, 200 watts, so they get a further point for that. And then uh, we can say that in Northern Territory they do have trials planned and they do have those trials in fact underway, so that's good. They are legal on private property and they are legal on footpaths and shared paths, so they get the point for that. And they are actually legal in bike lanes, which is very unusual. So they get a point for that. So that gives Northern Territory seven points, so not bad. Their speed limit is 15 kilometres on paths and shared paths, and it's 15 kilometres also on roads, so a flat limit there. And their penalty for non-compliance is $316. That's what that'll set you back don't know about the penalty for speeding and the age restriction on uh, riding scooters under the trial is 18 years of age. And so we finally come to New South Wales, last and by all means least. Section 244A of the road rules sums up the New South Wales government's position nicely, I think. It states, Rule 244A meaning of scooter and motorised scooter, of the Australian road rules has not been reproduced in these rules. This rule has been left blank in order to preserve uniformity of numbering with the Australian road rules. Oh, let's see if I can make it easier. Yes, Julie's right. Let's see if I can make it a little easier for you. Our electric scooter policy is intentionally left blank. 
And if there is any doubt about whether you can ride an e-scooter or any other micromobility device on public roads, refer to 242C, which says, A person must not travel in or on a wheeled recreational device on a road at any time while any person travelling in or on the device is wholly or partly assisted in propelling the device by means other than human power. And may the Lord have mercy on your wretched soul, should you choose to break this rule. Okay, so that's clear. But what about trials of e-scooters? Wasn't there something happening in Sydney last year? Well, yes. In March 2020, the Government Commissioned Electric Scooter Advisory Panel recommended that trials be conducted to enable assessment of the viability of e-scooters in urban areas. Indeed, there were trials planned for Sydney City, Manly and Bondi. However, these never got final approval from the New South Wales Government. It seems that the State Minister for Transport, Andrew Constance, is not in the mood to allow these trials to go ahead. So at this point in time, New South Wales is the worst state for facilitating electric scooters. Right, so time to score New South Wales, and this will be fairly quick because there's not much we can give them any score for because they don't recognize scooters in the road rules. There's just a big fat gap there where there should be scooter rules. Therefore, also, there's no uh, power limits specified. There's no trials planned. In fact, the minister has completely ruled them out. It'll happen over his dead body. We can only hope. And uh, trials are not completed. Uh, there's, oh, sorry, we can give them the point for private property because the only place that Andrew Constance can't stop you from riding your scooter is on your own property. Nowhere else. So that's that. And so they get... A big number one. I guess you could say they scored higher than the national road rules, but given that the national road rules are on the way, well on the way to uh, legalising scooters, they'll um, actually won't be any better than that. And uh, of course, none of these other ones apply. So, uh, what can we say about New South Wales? So finally, all the scores are in and we can compare all of our states on their friendliness towards electric scooters. And quite clearly here we can see that the uh, top of the leaderboard is shared by Queensland and the ACT. So just on the basis of scores, it's a dead heat at nine each out of a possible of 12 points. So well done. I think we can possibly split them because if we go down here um, and I wouldn't sort of look too much at the too closely at the speed limits and the fines because those you know you can argue whether they're safer or not safer and the fines are and they tend to drift around anyway uh, periodically but um, I you can see that Queensland the minimum age is 16 and in ACT, the minimum age is 12. So in terms of access to scooters, it means that there are more people in the ACT um, that would have access to riding scooters because they have a wider age range. So I would probably award it to ACT on that basis. I'm sure some Queenslanders would argue it the other way because in Queensland there's more choice of uh, scooters and companies and uh, and probably you know more more paths and road access that you have available there so they may argue that on that basis but in any case these states are doing very well and uh, progressing well with I guess you know normalizing scooters as a modern form of transport particularly in urban areas so well done Okay, so we've looked at the current situation regarding progress towards legalisation of electric scooters. Now let's take a look at what's in the pipeline. As mentioned, there is a lot of work underway at a national level, specifically the Australian road rules. The National Transport Commission began a project to review the barriers to adoption in 2019. It was finalised in November 2020 when the NTC presented its findings and made recommendations to all state transport ministers. These were broadly accepted by all states. The NTC's work is summarised in the Decision Regulation Impact Statement, 
available on its website. There is a lot of analysis contained in its 73 pages and in the end it distills down to these key recommendations. The NTC believes that the best approach to balance mobility and safety across the country would be to adopt PMD Regulatory Framework and Option 3 Speed Approach 1. So what is PMD Regulatory Framework? and Option 3, Speed Approach 1. Well, the PMD Regulatory Framework describes what a PMD is, and it very much resembles the description found on the Department of Infrastructure website. So here is the proposed regulatory framework for PMDs taken out of the document published by the NTC. And as you'll notice, it's very similar to the description of a PMD you will find on the Department of Infrastructure website. In fact, it's almost identical until you get down to the bottom section. So basically, they're saying that a PMD must have one or more wheels, so it could include a unicycle. It's propelled by one or more electric motors, and it's designed for use by a single person only, so no pillion passengers. Uh, it has an effective stopping system, so you must be able to brake the device without just sticking your feet on the ground. And when it's propelled by only a motor, it can't reach a speed greater than 25 kilometers an hour on level ground. So coming down to the bottom section here, you'll notice that it's been split into two categories by the NTC. So they have category A, which they call small and light devices, and category B, which uh, they call large and heavier devices. And they've stated in here that this is an optional category my understanding is that this was a request that came from some of the states as they believe that it's not necessarily appropriate to have the same sorts of conditions applied to a heavier device due to the, the greater kinetic energy in, that would be involved in the, in the event of a collision and possibly also just the sheer bulk of it on a footpath. So in category A, it's basically any device up to 25 kilograms unladen and for category B it's up to 60 kilograms unladen and here I think they're targeting things like segways although you don't see too many segways about these days so even at 60 kilograms that's well within the normal load uh, weight of a mobility device if you consider the mobility of devices used by disabled people their maximum unladen weight is 170 kilograms, so we're well under that. And of course, those devices are permitted currently to use footpaths. Now, let's take a look at option three, speed approach one. What does that mean? So section 4.2.3 gives us a description of option three and speed approach one. So option three in broad terms is to permit the use of personal mobility devices on most pedestrian infrastructure, bicycle paths and local roads. So you would have access to footpaths, shared paths, separated footpaths designated for use by bicycles and also dedicated bicycle paths. On top of that, you would also have access to local roads where the local road has a 50 km hour or less speed limit and no dividing line or median strip. If it's a one-way road, it cannot have more than one marked lane. So basically we're talking about quiet suburban streets. Speed approach number one defines being not permitted to travel at a speed faster than 10 kilometers an hour on a footpath or shared path and not permitted to travel at a speed faster than 25 kilometers an hour on a separated path designated for use of bicycles bicycle path or a local road. So 10 kilometers on a footpath is basically the current limit for a mobility device as used by a disabled person and that seems to be a sensible limit and the 25 kilometer an hour limit is actually it's based I believe on the average speed that's traveled by a cyclist on a cycle. Uh, the cyclists are not uh, they do not have such a speed limit on them but I believe the NTC did some research and calculated that that was indeed an average sort of speed for a bicycle on a road or on a bicycle path. And it makes sense if you're going to share that area with someone on a PMD, 
you want the person on the PMD to be going the same speed roughly as the other traffic on that lane, otherwise they become an obstacle. It looks like the NTC have taken a sensible approach to balancing access to infrastructure by PMD users with the safety of others, including pedestrians and cyclists. So when will it become law? Well, firstly, the Australian road rules are not law, but a model set of rules upon which individual states can frame their own laws. In terms of this revision and its release, the target is set for May 2021, and I received this update from the project leader on the 9th of March when I asked her if things were on track. So we can expect the latest version of the Australian road rules, including PMDs, to be drafted and sent to state transport ministers for their approval next month. The next piece of news is not nearly so positive, especially for those living in New South Wales. On the 4th of March this year, the New South Wales Transport Minister, Andrew Constance, announced that electric scooter trials that were planned for three council areas in Sydney were to be abandoned. The reason Mr Constance gave for this was that he was, quote, not in the mood to have electric scooters on Sydney streets. This guy looks like he's not in the mood to get out of bed each day. Now, I understand that he has lived through the horrendous bushfires that ravaged his electorate in 2020, and this no doubt has left Mr Constance with some post-traumatic stress. But he needs to join the dots here. It is widely agreed by scientists and bushfire experts, and indeed Mr Constance himself, that the fires of 2020 were made worse by a warming planet. Electric scooters and other personal mobility devices can be a significant part of the solution to this problem. By providing commuters with a low emission, low cost alternative to using their car to get to work each day, we can substantially reduce their carbon footprint. If just 5% of commuters in Sydney swapped their car for an electric scooter, we would reduce carbon emissions by up to 1.5 million tonnes every year. Beyond lower carbon emissions, greater use of electric scooters in our busy cities will result in cleaner air and less road congestion. So what's not to like about them? Oh yes, a man died in Brisbane after having an accident on an e-scooter. Well yes, a man died in Brisbane, but it turns out he actually died of a heart attack post-accident, not from injuries sustained. In any case, that pales when compared to the 48 cyclists who died in 2020 from road accidents. And no one is calling for a ban on bicycles. So Mr Constance needs to stop his knee-jerk reaction to bad media stories from overseas and take the advice of Australian experts like the National Transport Authority. He needs to accept that micromobility will not go away because he chooses to ignore it. And as Minister for Transport, he needs to find ways to make it safe and accessible for commuters. That's his job. That's why we pay him the big bucks. I mean, really, this is a guy who commissions an expert panel to investigate and report on the viability of PMDs and then chooses to ignore their recommendations to proceed with trials. So why did you waste taxpayers' money on a report when you already knew the outcome? Okay, so now we are fully up to date. What conclusions can be drawn from all this information? Well, most obviously, electric scooter laws vary greatly depending on which state you live in. Hmm, so much for I am, you are, we are Australians. That aside, it seems some states like Queensland and the ACT are making very good progress towards full legalisation of e-scooters and other personal mobility devices while other states, not mentioning any names, (coughs) New South Wales and Tasmania, are dragging their heels. Something to do with conservative governments, maybe. There is a clear dividing line between states based on whether they choose to classify electric scooters as motorised scooters, personal mobility devices or motor vehicles. If a particular government wants to outlaw e-scooters, All they need to do is classify them as motor vehicles and prohibit them on the basis that they cannot be registered for road use due to the fact that they don't comply with the Australian design rules. However, this approach is at odds with the National Motor Vehicle Standards Act 1989 and the way it is interpreted by the Australian Department of Infrastructure. The department has clearly classified PMDs as non-road vehicles, meaning they don't require registration. I would also say it makes no sense to limit the power of a scooter as it is the speed that causes problems, not power. The speed power curve will vary depending on the weight of the rider, the scooter, and the amount of incline and headwind they encounter. The approach of limiting speed and power on motorised scooters, and then allowing them to be used on public roads, seems to invite tragedy, since they can't move quickly enough to get out of the way of a collision. 
We don't impose power limits on cars or motorcycles, and that's because it serves no purpose. We do, however, impose speed limits, and that's the approach we should take with PMDs. It's also the recommendation of the National Transport Commission. Most governments acknowledge the benefits of electric scooters as an alternative to car transport, like this comment from the WA government website. Devices such as e-scooters have grown in popularity in response to the community demand for more innovative and sustainable travel choices, which have the potential to lessen car dependence and more efficiently connect people with cities and communities. Yet so far, every trial except the ones in Queensland and the ACT have excluded the use of privately owned scooters. This is most unfortunate since private owners are more likely to use their scooter as a daily commuting option, effectively taking a car off the road each day. There is also strong evidence that private owners are more safety conscious and compliant with regulations than rental users. Research reported in the Medical Journal of Australia in 2019 found an interesting result after observing rider behaviour over a four-day period in Brisbane. Only 61% of hire scooter riders were observed to be correctly wearing a helmet compared to 96% of owner riders. It seems those on hire scooters are sullying the reputation of all riders. Their misdemeanours are eagerly sensationalised by the media to convince the general public that these dangerous hooligans and their newfangled contraptions are a danger to us all. But it's too easy for lawmakers to blame hire companies and their patrons for the bad behaviour, when in reality they have been asleep at the wheel when it comes to regulation. It would be wrong to assume, as Andrew Constance has done, that electric scooter riders are irresponsible and non-compliant when you have not even told them what the rules are. Why not start from a position of believing that most Australians want to do the right thing once they are told what that is? Set some sensible rules, and yes, penalties if needed, and then let people get on with their lives. It works for cars. It works for motorcycles. It'll work for PMDs. Oh, and if PMDs have to have a license plate attached to them for identification purposes, then so be it. And if we have to have some form of insurance cover, that's fine too. But let's just try looking for solutions before we trip up on all the problems. If you've stayed till the end of this video, then thanks for that. It's been a long journey, but I hope some of the information has been useful to you. I'll continue to follow events in this space and will release short update videos whenever something changes. So if you want to catch those updates, please subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to be informed of new content. In the meantime, stay safe and ride on.